what does a teacher need to be successful? What ongoing systems of support do we need to have in place for teachers? How do we increase teacher voice into all the things that impact them? Something that would be really important is to just ask them. Like so often we are solving a problem that we don't really know what the problem is. Right? Asking our teachers what it is that you need. What do we need to have as a motivator for them? What training do they need? And then let's solve that problem together. And I think the beautiful part about Leader Me is we're solving all of those problems alongside school leaders. Welcome everyone to the Change Starts Here podcast. I'm your host, Dustin Odom. And this week, I am honored and excited to welcome my friend, Ashley Caranco. Ashley has worked with Franklin Covey for almost a decade now. Uh, prior to that, so she's as a coach but uh, and as a coaching director now, but she's also uh, been a principal, a dean of students, an assistant principal, a teacher. Um, so she has tons of education, education experience. She's also emceed a number of our uh, events across the country, uh, our symposiums, but also other events. And she's just someone that uh, lights up every room she walks into. And I think you'll recognize that pretty quickly. Someone I've wanted to have on the podcast for a long time. Someone I'd like to potentially figure out a way to make a regular contributor because I just uh, appreciate her heart and her intent uh, and her brilliance. And so this is a conversation we talk, we dive in talking about uh, leadership and culture within buildings. We work on a little bit of student success and we actually get into life as a parent. I think there's a lot of nuggets in this conversation. So I'd encourage you all to stick with it because as I'm going through the conversation, I didn't recognize that we would take certain turns and it was just awesome and very authentic. And I'm walking away with a number of things that uh, I want to do to get better in my life, both personally and professionally. So as always, if you're a subscriber, thanks for subscribing. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. It helps us continue to grow our impact. Uh, and as I say, always at the end, um, as you listen to this podcast, if there's someone in your life who could be uplifted by Ashley's words, please share this with them in whatever way you're listening to it. But I um, hope you guys enjoy this conversation as much as I did. All right, Ashley, I cannot thank you enough for making time to get here. I think we've been trying to get this coordinated for a couple months now, at least in my head, a couple of years. This is long overdue. So regardless, thank you for making time to be here with us today. Man, I am excited. I was uh, like super antsy sleeping last night, just waiting on this time together today. Yeah. <laughs> uh, for those of you who are listening, haven't met Ashley. Ashley, as you heard in my intro, is one of my favorite people I get to work with. We've worked together for almost a decade now, and she is uh, someone who, um, as you'll see quickly, just someone as real as they get, and someone who just brings me joy every time I get a chance to be around her. So with that, no pressure. Um, my favorite question that I stole um, from Brad, Brad Montague years ago is, who are you and what do you love about what you do? Uh, so Ashley Caranco and a parent of four. Um, I'm going to be young forever because we have uh, soon to be 14 year olds and a two year old. So <laughs> y'all just <laughs> put that in perspective. <laughs> um, and uh, I get to do every single day, I get to impact the lives of kids and adults. Um, we're going for every student in every corner with Leader and Me. And so I serve as a coaching director. And um, what I love about what I do is that 99.9% .9 of the time, it doesn't feel like work because I know the impact. Um, I know just just the people like getting to talk to schools getting to talk to kids getting to talk to coaches and client partners and everybody that's serving impacting the lives of kids is just great great work so when you talk about impact i mean i, I believe people whether they've worked with you know our organization franklin covey or any organization or no organization just within schools are making phenomenal impact across the country i'm curious what led you here? What's the impact that wakes you up every day that you get so excited about that makes it sometimes, even the hardest days, not feel like a job for you? Yeah. You know, um, I loved being a school leader. Um, I usually say that Franklin Covey's like the government, like they find you and recruit you out of your happy place. And, um, and it's so true. Like I loved what I was doing before I joined Franklin Covey. The thing that I did not like about education was just starting over every year. Like you start over with a full staff, you get new kids, they rezone there. There's new testing, new curriculum, like everything's always new. 
And I felt like it was always a moving target. And I think with Leader Me, the impact is that we're focusing on all of the things that we know make schools successful. Leadership, culture, academics, all at the same time, every single day. So if one of those starts to spin out, like if your academic spins out and you've got some new curriculum that comes down the pipe, we, we're grounded in leadership and culture and we know how to navigate to bring those academics back in. Yeah. So when you talk about success, though, you know, I, obviously we've worked together for a decade, so I think we both have a common definition. But if I'm listening and I hear someone say, all right, so you want you want to have results and leadership and culture. What does that look like? Like, how, how, how do you define success, I guess, in those three areas? So my usual would be that I would Google success because I would want to know what like Webster says. Uh, but because we're recording, I won't do that. So you don't have to look at me <laughs> stare off at another screen. But I would say, I would say success looks different um, for every single school. Um, but overall, it's that we are, we have leadership at every level, four-year-old, three-year-old, all the way up to the superintendent. Um, everyone feels equipped, empowered to be a leader of themselves and others. And then in terms of culture, I think that it's, if I had to oversimplify it, it would be that the release of adults owning everything that's happening with a school has shifted to kids because they're the only people that's the constant. All of us could change. And so our kids are gonna continue to go to a school and they have determined what the culture looks like, how they wanna be treated, how they wanna be um, you know, celebrated. Everything is based on our students. And so that shift in culture, people wanna to go to work. Like I would wanna to go to work if kids were articulating to me, what does the assembly look like? What would we yeah. have in the cafeteria? I want to go to work. I don't want to have to go make those decisions. So when kids are involved in it, they just see it so different than we do. Yeah. So it sounds like one of the successes, and I, I used to love saying this about our lighthouse schools. It's a place that when you walk into, you know, you want to work and you also would want your kids to go to school there, any kid you yep. know, or any other educator to also work there with you. And so when you think about as you walk into schools or as your team of coaches walk into schools, how do you help folks diagnose uh, culture related issues? Right. So, uh, you know, an easy question is if I'm listening and I'm an assistant soup or a soup and or principal thinking, all right, do people want to come work here? Not everybody. OK, so where do I go next? How do you help them dive a little bit deeper to figure out where they should start? Yeah, I think as you were just saying about a lighthouse school or walking into a school, it feels different. Um, so it, one part of the diagnosis would be like, Hey, take me, if I was a new employee, new principal, new teacher, take me on a tour of what I would experience. And then what does that feel like to you? What does it look like? What does it sound like? What does it feel like? Is it what you want it to? Because I know oftentimes we're, we're so removed, right? As a leader, you're removed from a classroom, you're removed from, you know, common areas, PLCs. And so, so how, how do you want it to look, sound and feel? And then if it doesn't, what are we going to do about it? How do you identify your ideal and then make that ideal a reality? I mean, right now I would say, um, you know, we're living in a unprecedented times where, Every type of school, and it's not just, you know, uh, inner city schools or rural schools that are struggling to find teachers and keep teachers. Every school in America seems Everybody. to be struggling, keep retaining staff and attracting new staff. What are some key strategies that you've seen work in the schools or districts that you've been a part of or worked with that would help them today? Because I feel like that's something that, you know, I look at my wife right now uh, that just keeps her and her team up constantly right now. Yeah, I think that is at the top of every conversation that we're having with principals and district level leaders. How do we get good people and how do we keep them? Um, and w the first thing I think is we're focusing on teacher wellness. So that looks different than it has before. Um, what does a teacher need to be successful? What do we, what ongoing systems of support do we need to have in place for teachers? How do we increase teacher voice? into all the things that impact them. And then I think something that would be really important is to just ask them. Like so often we are solving a problem that we don't really know what the problem is, right? Asking our teachers, what it is that you need? 
we give out gene passes all the time. Like prime example, we give out gene passes all the time. People don't care about jeans. <laughs> like, like nobody, they're wearing jeans anyway. Just, just for everybody on this recording to know, they're wearing the jeans, whether we tell them to or not. So we're just glad they're at work. So we're not even saying anything. So, so what do we need to have as a motivator for them? What training do they need? And then let's solve that problem together. And I think the beautiful part about Leader Me is we're solving all of those problems alongside school leaders. So we're partnering, we're partnering with districts for aligning everything that you have as a district. Let's align that to Leader Me. What is it that you're trying to solve? That's the problem that we want to solve alongside you, as opposed to us saying, hey, do this thing take this and make it work in your school. We're working together in partnership to make it work in schools. Yeah. It's funny. You said, uh, that jeans, uh, teachers are wearing them anyways. Uh, it made me think of one of the challenges I hear from a lot of my principal friends is that, uh, in the past they would address, you know, things like that. And now people are not. And so how do you find the balance in a leadership position of, still holding people to high expectations, even though deep down you're fearful that they might be leaving if you push them too hard. Like you've got, you still, you have to find that balance. So I'm curious what kind of encouragement you have for people who are trying to live in that, that world. Yeah. I'm, I'm hearing uh, Dr. Covey in the green and clean video, holding them accountable in the way agreed. Like so often we're like, here's how I'm going to hold you accountable. <laughs> Like, you got to come to work, you got to sign in, you got to submit your lesson plans. Like, let's agree. Because a lot of stuff is, is just a task. But we don't want people doing tasks. We want people making an impact. We want the work that they're doing, the work that we're holding them accountable to, to make an impact on the lives of kids. That's, that's what it's all about. So let's partner on a way that we can agree of what's accountable. You know, um, just hearing you say about genes, like, I think back over a decade ago, I wouldn't say anything about people wearing jeans, <laughs> like because it. I was scared they would leave then, right? Now it's even worse. So what is it? What's most important that we can hold people to, and then we got to help them with it, because so often we're holding them accountable, just like we're being held accountable, but we're not providing the ongoing supports, and that's really important. Yeah. So you know, trying to create high functioning or high trust, high functioning cultures for staff and students is something that most people are aspiring to. And it's even more critical today than ever. And so I'm I'm wondering, as you've traveled the country, I mean, I think you've worked across half the US or you've definitely been everywhere in North America. Um, What are the most effective systems or strategies you've seen that schools have had in place to have cultures to create cultures where kids want to show up every day and staff want to show up every day. They would never want to, they, you know, would really ever want to leave. Yeah. Dustin, you said something that, that pricked my heart. We got to go back and talk about it. Trust. We don't, we don't have to talk about it right now, but we got to talk about trust. Um, But I think the first thing that comes to mind about the people wanting to be there is how it feels, right? That's number one. And number two is, is celebration. Like how, why do I want to go and, and be connected? So like how it feels belonging. Do I feel like I have a place? Do I feel like the work that I do every day is valued, celebrated? So a big strategy that a lot of schools are doing is like a monthly, if you could do weekly, if you could swing it, if you could swing bi-weekly, whatever that looks like for you, but some some ongoing cadence, meaning that it happens regularly of celebrating adults and kids, because some people have it really down packed to celebrate kids. They miss the adult part. So how do we celebrate both for effort and so like like what is it? Progress and proficiency. Like how do we celebrate both of those? Um, and then how is what we're doing contributing to us getting better? So once we celebrate it, how do people leave inspired to do something different? Like I was at a school a few years ago and they were celebrating attendance, right? Which we all know is like outside of our circle of control, not a wig, but, but if we don't focus on it, it'll run away with it. 
you know, we'll lose it. And so the, the school, the kids, there's their drum roll, they're laying on the ground, their drum roll. And they said, okay, our attendance is 93%. And then all of a sudden the kids go, you can do better. You can do better. You can do better. And, and they're like, yeah, I can do better. You know, like we're going for 97. You can do better. Like it wasn't like you should do better. It was, you can do better. Like, come on, let's get with it. We can do better. And so I think that little feeling that, that sense of belonging, that tether of, hey, we're holding you accountable, but but you can do better. Like that ongoing celebration will help you in the end. Yeah, well, I know you've worked with uh, high free and reduced lunch school districts. So I'm sure there's some folks that uh, may, not be aware, yeah, may not be aware of your background uh, that would say, well, you know, I mean, yeah, but what do you do with kids that are in a community where it is tough for them to show up or the attendance has been historically really low. Uh, does that cripple them creating that accountability? What would you say to that? Uh, if someone was like, yeah, I don't know if I want them shouting out, we could do better. I like it, but you know, there may be yeah. folks that may be turned off the other way. Yeah. I think uh great, great question. We have this conversation all the time. Like awareness is the first step though, right? Like if we don't ever make people aware of it, they can never do anything about it. And so I think in setting our goal, we might not set it at 100% because we know that's not realistic. We might not set it at 97%. We know that's not realistic. But if we don't ever make people aware, then there's nothing that they can do about it, right? It's, it's like talking about the kid's data and leaving the kid out of the conversation. Like involving them at least lets them say, hey, here's why I can't come. Or, hey, here's what I could do. Like, I know I'm always late. My mom never gets me here on time because... She's got to drop off my other five siblings and I don't get her on time, but I can make sure I do my homework that way in that first, you know, bell ringer, I'm already ready. Like I've already done that part. So involving them in the conversation at least creates awareness. And I think that's, if we do that, at least when they go out into the world, they'll be aware of it. Like you can't just say, Hey, I never went to school on time for 17 years. And that's just kind of how I roll. Nobody's ever shared with me. At least we have created an awareness and they go out into the real world and we'll be able to do something about it. Yeah. I mean, to that point, I, I feel like chronic absenteeism, just like retention of staff and a tr a tr hiring new staff is a challenge for everyone. Chronic absenteeism is creeping up since COVID everywhere. Yeah. And so it sounds like one of the strategies, obviously, to combat that would be awareness. But secondly, I'm curious, you talked uh, early on about leadership from three or four year olds all the way up yeah. to the board. How does developing a leadership culture play a role in improving chronic absenteeism? Man, I think uh, when you're having a conversation with a person any age about, hey, let's look at this past week. You came to school two days, right? What's that look like for you? You know, what'd you miss? We missed you. What'd you miss? What would you like to come to school more days? How, like just involving them in that conversation. One, I think the brain plays tricks on us. Like we create patterns of things that happen more often than they really do or less often, right? Like you think I've been to school the past five days. When you look, really look at the data, you only went to school two days. Like, But unless somebody's drawing you back to that, unless you're tracking it, unless you're keeping it at the forefront of your thoughts, like you're not able to do anything about it. So in this leadership culture that we're building, we're having these conversations from as soon as they get to school. Like you keep track of your data. You determine what you want to do. You set a lead measure for yourself. If you want to come to school more, what does that look like for you? Right? Like how can we partner with you to support you to clear the path to make it happen? That's awesome. I think that goes a long way to something you asked me to go back to two questions ago, which is trust um, and yeah. how you create trust. So when I said that word, what, what was it that moved in your heart? Man, I think uh, what first came to mind was all the places where I loved, uh, including Franklin Covey, uh, is, is just a trust. Like, I feel trusted. I trust the people around me. I know if I miss it, like, it, like I'm still good. I can just come back the next day and start over, or the next hour, whatever. And I think we're all running a million miles a minute, and that's impacting trust. Right. Like we're we're getting I, I was just talking to somebody that they're getting a new principal, a new regional director, a new superintendent, a new person over funding. Like 
all of these people are new. Like, how do you build trusting relationships and go faster? We know trust is the accelerator to being able to go faster and get things done. But if we don't even know the people that we're working with, we don't know our kids, we don't know our staff, like that is missing. The trust is missing. So if we were to even consider another strategy, if, if you would, um, like focusing in on trust would be huge. So how do you build that, right? Like you can take that, take, take this question from any vantage point uh, that you yeah. want, whether it's the person who is experiencing all these new folks above them or one of the new, new people, you know, the, the folks in the new role, how, how do you go about even establishing trust and quickly because you need to move the ball down the floor? Yeah, I think uh, first thing that comes to mind, get to know the people, like get to know them, whatever that looks like, get in the buildings, get in the classrooms, connect, get to know them. And then the second thing would just be to be open and honest, like open, honest, early communication. All of that goes a long way. People might not agree with it, but at least if they understand it and you're, you've been honest about it, you've communicated, you know, it's like, I don't agree, but I understand why and I'm on board. So I think those two things will really move people forward. Like, and people want to work like back to the, the teacher retention. Like if I know I'm going to get the honest truth, they're going to communicate with me often and early and people are going to get to know me as a person. I want to work there. Like that's yeah. a place where I'm going to feel valued. So, I mean, within that, I mean, I'm even thinking back, back to your HISD days. Um, culture and leadership are really important. And we know it, yep. it's really important today to be able to keep staff. So that's great. However, kids are more behind academically than they've ever been in, in all across the country, but um, especially in the areas that you and I both taught in. I, How do you respond to those educators say, I don't have time. I would love to focus on building a great culture and having my kids feel like they're leaders, but I've got to get them to learn to read and do math. What's your response to that and helping them get the results that they want? Man, I I might be an unpopular opinion, right? Or the, the dissenter, but I think that what what's the quote? They'll never care how much you know unless they know how much you care. Like it goes back to that foundation. I'm just thinking about Rita Pearson. They have to like you. Like, like we need to all go back and watch Rita's TED talk because if if we don't like our kids and our job and they they know kids are like two sniffs and they know you're faking it right like they just will sit there for 180 days so if we don't create that culture no matter what they're not learning and we know if we miss it for a day a week a year that's just widening the gap so we have to put the investment in now which it doesn't take that long like it really doesn't this is like a 15 minute morning meeting you start to build your culture in your classroom six weeks in of doing this 15 minutes, three weeks in of doing this 15 minutes, you've got totally different kids. They're plugged in. They're connected. You add some leadership roles to your classroom. They have a reason, a purpose to come to school. They want to do that thing so that they can do the other things in your classroom. So if we just invest short-term investment, long-term yields, like I'm advocating for it. It's funny you say it. when I first came here, uh, you know, I guess what, 12 years ago, I was so skeptical of leadership roles. I came around, you know, because school turnaround was my background. And so I'm like, this seems like a bunch of nonsense. Like yeah. the line leader, the I, I found the bug leader one time. That's a whole nother story that we could have later. Um, but I just early on, I was like, what, what does this do? And then as I started talking to kids and realizing the kids, actually, there's a culture in these schools schools that, you know, that are operating at a high level where kids think this class will cease to exist or operate if they don't show up and do that thing, which is crazy. Is that what you're seeing all across the country when people put yes. you know, effective leadership roles in and you know, morning meetings and those type of things? Yes, yes, yes. And yes. Like, I mean, I can even say from my own personal kids, right? Like my kid was five before the world shut down and he was a linebacker. I was like, are y'all playing football at school? Like what, like what's happening? Why are you the linebacker? And then I went to the school, like he comes home talking about he's a linebacker, 
right? He's little. Can't really articulate what a linebacker is. I go to school. It's actually the caboose. They've just changed the name, right? He's the back of the line, the linebacker. And he just felt like he had to go every single day because the line would not have an end to it. And it would just like be a snake that just lost people along the way if he wasn't doing his job. And that's at age five. Like just the investment. I mean, like we see in middle schools where they've got a table leader as a leadership role. And they've got six different tables across the room. And those people are the go-to for asking questions. So like teacher's able to pull her small groups. She's doing her thing. And the kids are asking another kid a question. And they're saying, hey, I don't know. Let me go connect with another table leader. Like just the level of ownership and investment in the classroom and things that are important to them in their whole school. My kid thought the line was just going to lose people like that. That changes the way they see school. Yeah. I love it. I think so for the folks that, um, again, like I was 12 years ago, skeptical of how the leadership and culture play a role into getting the academic results. I think that's really helpful. But when you climb into the academics, we've been, we've spent this entire semester having solo episodes and research episodes and guest episodes around the four disciplines of execution. So when you think about the fundamentals of that work inside the academic bubble of school turnaround, what are the most, what, what are the key components that you see time and time again, drive success? So when you walk into a school, you're thinking, Man, if you do A, B, and C, I'm confident you guys are going to achieve your wigs. Laser focus on one thing, like really narrowing in on the one thing. What's the main thing we, main problem we're working to solve, the main gap we're trying to close? Scoreboards, like that are easy to understand. Kids can articulate. I can check and see at any point whether I'm winning or losing. Uh, and then celebrations, right? And and what I left out was discipline too. And I would say it's key as well. I was like, dang, I don't know how I'm going to answer this. Like, you need all four. You need all four disciplines. But I think discipline too. The thing about it is that might not be the one you see as much, right? That's the lever. And if the lever's not working, the others aren't going to work either. So you got your laser focus in discipline one. You've got your scoreboards in discipline three, and you are celebrating like nobody's business in discipline four. And that's got everybody excited about the work that you're doing. And then the behind the scenes, the the day-to-day tweaking, uh, what is it? Like uh, kind of fine-tuning our car. Like we're, we're going on, we got to get an oil change. Okay, we got to change our tires. Those are all, that's discipline too. Like if that's not happening, the other three and four are not happening either. And we're not making any progress towards our goal. How do you help people stay on track, right? Because I think there's a lot of schools and I'm sure I would be guilty of this. I have been in other roles where we get all the scoreboards set up. We get you know the right lead measures. We create the system of accountability and excitement and we're moving towards it and celebrating. Um, but yet there's either a busy couple of weeks, some crazy thing happens at school and just kind of takes us off course. How do you help schools uh stay on track or get back on track when life happens? Well, I'd say number one, the easiest thing to do to make sure that you stay on track is give it to kids. Like you could tell, y'all know, when you have kids, if you don't have kids, just trust me on this. Just take my word. If you tell a child today, in seven years, we're going to go to Disney World. Like seven years from today, they are going to ask you about it. Like they will just hold your feet to the fire. So if you give it to kids to update your scoreboards, to make sure you're doing celebrations, all of those, like kids, they will do it. We get distracted in the whirlwind of life. They will make it happen. But if you get off track, that's okay. Like you miss it. Just get back on track. Like, so what systems do you put in place for yourself? Like every faculty meeting, do you check in on your goal? Every time you have PLCs, you check in our goal. First of every month, whatever it is, just put, you know how we put calendar reminders in our calendar, put it in there to check in with your goal and you'll be on track, right? And if you miss it, give yourself grace. We're all doing the very best we can. Start over again. I think that's my favorite answer in my, what, three years of doing the podcast is if you have kids, you know, give it to kids because I'm looking back here and the people who can watch can always see my three kids behind me. But Luke, my uh, 10 year old yesterday uh, after church, we would go to lunch and he remembered, I don't know, 
in November, he was asking to go to play putt putt somewhere. And I'm like, it's too cold. Mm -hmm. I go in April, we'll get to it. And I'm thinking in the month of April, I remember I, cause I wrote it down that day. So it'll come back to me literally yesterday. He was like that, that he said in April, April, we're going to go right. It's April. I'm like, bud, we've got the whole month. We can't do it today. You've got football, all these things. Uh, it's just hysterical to think if you just give it to kids, they will they will run they with do. it. <laughs> they totally do. And they will hold you accountable. Like, they're not going to let you forget. I'm like, you forget to brush your teeth. <laughs> like, like, how does this happen? But you can hold me accountable. But it works. Just use it. Leverage your resources. God, this is thing. That's a whole other conversation we should have. Getting kids to brush their teeth is just a nightmare right now. Um, not for all of them. Not for all of them. There's one up here is really good. There's a couple that are kind of a pain. Um, you know, Ash, obviously I adore you and I'm really excited to try to get you engaged with me more in this moving forward, this podcast that is. Uh, today was just more of an interview because I want people to understand what you're about, who you are, how you help people yeah. lead. And so when you joined uh, this morning, as you were thinking about it, was there anything in particular that was on your heart that I didn't ask about today that you were hoping to share or something that um, has really just been sitting on your mind as we've gotten ready for this? Oh man. I, um, I think there's a couple of things that are always top of mind for me. Um, one, uh, a dear friend of ours, actually Jill Shulin, she always asked me, um, like, who are you using to get better? Uh, because so often in roles like ours and like much of the listeners, like you are running a million miles a minute. You're responsible for a lot of decisions, a lot of people. Um, even if you are a teacher, you are responsible for a lot of people. Like you've got a lot of people in your class. You've got people at home. Like how are you getting better? So I think that would be one thing that I definitely want to in our future talk about. Like how are you getting better? So who is in your circle that's making you better? That's definitely one thing. Like, take it with you, think about it, look at your circle, who do you need to add, and then what are you doing for you? Like, I, I so often <laughs> operate with the, like, sleep when I die type thing, right? Like, you know, you're a parent, you are a professional, you are on boards and volunteering and driving and all the things, right? Like, all the things that you're doing and you just don't have time for yourself. So, like, how are you getting better professionally? Who's in your circle? And how are you taking time for you? All right. What are the two things that I was like, I bet Dustin's going to ask me about those two things. <laughs> well, that, that question is, I mean, obviously Jill's a very, very dear friend of both of ours. Um, and she's changed my life in many ways as well. And I feel like, um, you know, you've got four, I've got three. It, it's, it's hard. The hard, At this stage of life, it feels so hard. And uh, Jill has a slew of kids as well. So I mean, just she knows five. Like she just one-upped us. I, I wasn't going to put that out there, but yes, that's <laughs> little kids. Uh, and I, I would say um, creating the discipline, knowing that like we always say go slow to go fast. And so the the one thing that's been on my heart lately, which um, I was just listening to my uh, um, sermon of pod, podcast recently, that was taking a day, you know, whether it's a month or a quarter, start with a quarter if life seems crazy, but just get away with a notebook and nothing like no sounds like i'm i'm notorious about always having sound around me and just thinking about personally and professionally what are the biggest stressors in my life right now and just sit with your thoughts sit with yourself yep. um and just capture what you're learning what you're thinking your ideas and just seeing that over time i feel like is really key but i am I'm awful with silence if you meet my three kids you'll know that they've not been taught silence because both ashley and i are uh, talkers, I'm sure everybody's shocked. And so I don't have the best advice for you for that, but I am with you on that is something we've got to get to is figure out how do we make time for ourselves to really sit with ourselves, not just like distract ourselves more. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's key. You, you said a couple of things for me that I really anchored into. Um, I, I have even found like over the years reading, you leave school, undergrad, to go to graduate school. Like everything you're reading is for a purpose. And then as soon as you get done, you're like, I'm never reading again. Like, like ever is not going to happen. And then you I need to it. continue. <laughs> you need, I'm glad I'm not alone. You need to continue to get better. And so like reading is a, a really good thing. That's a quiet space, right? Or like, even if you're listening to it, you know, on an, an audible, on a book, it's still you 
And I have just started like capturing thoughts and quotes. And uh, I know recently you got the book Green Lights and it triggered me. I started reading it a long time ago and I f- I'm almost done like reading that while well, on Audible. Um, but just pulling some of those things forward into the who I want to be, because I think sometimes we're really stuck in who I am and who I need to be and who people need me to be. But it's it's really who I want to be. I love that. Uh, I may have to have you talk to my wife after this because she is also someone who goes and gets it and just gets stuff done. Mm-hmm. And so that pause of like, hey, I know that you know who I want you to be. I know who you know that the kids want you to be, but like, who does Ashley want to be? Um, my wife is also named Ashley for those listeners. Ashley knows this, but those who don't know, but who does Ashley want to be? And I think that's something that is really hard. I can only imagine, I and mean, Ashley and I've had some deep conversations. When you're a mom, so you guys have been both successful your whole career, just busting your tail. And now you've got kids that are like, mom, 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 I could be sitting right next to them, like right now. And sure. they would not say anything to me. Mom walks in, they're like, mom, I'm hungry. Mom, this. Pass you like, up. How does that even happen? Because I know I'm not trying to create it. And so it just always happens. And so it's really easy to lose your identity during that stage of life, I have to assume. It is. It very, very much is. And and I think personally, the biggest struggle, because I told y'all earlier, I have 14-year-olds and a two-year-old, is like, like being present in their lives, right? I think you get you get the older ones and you're like, okay, four more years. And I'm done. (laughs) And then you've got a two year old. So like, how do you, how do you not have him think that your whole world is work? Because he just sees all that, right? Like the big kids are at school. They don't see any of that. Like there's this really tough balance of being a working professional, being a parent, being a spouse, you know, and, and being all the other things that you, we have so many roles. Like we have tons of roles, go back to seven habits. You have tons of roles and how do you balance them and how do you say no to some? Like what's, how do you say uh, your best no to say your best yes? That's an ongoing struggle. Yeah. It's a topic for another podcast. I actually think we do need to come back to that at some point, whether it's in the middle of next season or over the summer, but that like, I, I'm going to invite my wife on the podcast. We can invite Jill to talk about it um, because there's definitely some privilege. Like I said, as a, as a man, like while I'm trying to be in the middle of it where the kids just look past me. And so there is, a level of weight that I don't feel or I don't get for some reason. Right. And probably yeah. means I need to be a better dad in some ways, but like I, I see so many things on uh, TikTok or Instagram that show that joke constantly of kids looking past dad to be like mom or, you know, one spouse to look for another partner. Like I, I just, uh, yeah, I just, I think that's something we probably should unpack a little bit further. I didn't think we would get to that topic, but that is life, Ash. That is life. It really is. It so really, really is. I promise to get you out of here on time. So I'm going to ask okay. our, our rapid fire questions. Okay. What's a habit or discipline that you utilize every day or every week that allows you to be the best version of yourself? One. Uh, just one. I, your favorite. Not, and again, we're not talking like seven habits. We're talking just like habit or discipline in your life. Yeah. So I would say I am really, really, really focusing on pausing. For a lot of reasons. So uh, in the pause, people are able to find their own answer. I think uh, like being a principal, being a parent, like those roles, people look to you for answers. Like when they come to you, they they need you to answer it. And I think we are so conditioned to doing that, that we are short changing our people from even thinking through, from even processing. Um, and I think if you pause, like your responses are shorter, they're more succinct, like you're more direct, you read the question better. So often we're just like, boom, 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 boom. Like I see it. I think I understand what you're asking and I respond and it's not right. And then it costs me more time in the end. So pausing in all the things, like just taking time, hitting pause, responding to the email in five minutes instead of five seconds, like enjoying the pause. That's great. I, uh, uh, you said earlier about the audible. So my next question is uh, around that I've recruited my wife over time to get to more audible. Not that reading is bad, but in this stage of life, if I'm going to be present when we're around, like my reading time would be like when we're sitting next to each other. But now that like it feels busy and chaotic all the time, I want to be present there. And so that means my in between times have become my reading times. And so audible has been a big thing to me. And so it doesn't have to be a physical book, but what's a book you either read throughout your life or career or one that you've read recently that 
you want others to check out? So I, I just recommended this to Jill. Here we go again. Um, and it's a good one. It's a quick read. Um, I'm an Oprah Winfrey, Winfrey fan. So if you ever want to invite me back on the podcast with Oprah, I'd be happy to join. Um, but you should better partner the podcast. We've not had Oprah. (laughs) You should totally read what I know for sure. Okay. What I know for sure by Oprah Winfrey quick read. Um, I'll just give you a little snippet. Um, it challenges kind of your, not so much your core, but your core thinking like, uh, so quick question for you, Dustin, what do you know for sure? Uh, well, I could get really existential on you on this one. You don't want that, but I know that, uh, I love my wife and kids very much. And that is the core of what I kind of operate out of. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a solid one. Like we know the sun's going to rise. We know the sun's going to set. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like you could, you could do that kind of thing, but it really challenges. Like once you go past that, like, like what else do you know for sure? Like mm. 100%. Um, so you should read it. Totally. Right. I'm, I'm in for that. You can tell where I go. If you go down that path, I'm like, Oh God, I've got so many thoughts. Uh, all right. What I know for sure by Oprah. All right. Uh, this question I'm really interested in for you. What is, if you had a walk up song right now to kind of set your, tenor for the day or are you going on stage which you and I have done together a few times what would be your walk-up song man I was trying to think about what did my student uh pick for me in San Diego because the student picked my walk-up song um it was awesome I'm gonna have to look it up and I'll have to tell you but I I actually think about this on a regular basis yeah. um I wish I had walk-up music playing regularly but yep. I think I would choose I'm every woman Oh, I could almost sing that right now. Anything, something, do it naturally. Whoa, whoa. Okay, all right, stop. I, I, really, yep. yeah. <laughs> See, that's why I love asking walk-up songs. It takes you to a place within a second. In the zone. Oh, that's amazing. I love that one. Uh, all right, last question. Uh, this hopefully will be easy one for you. Is there a piece of leadership advice? It could be, you know, like our friend Kim Nelson, who likes to post quotes on uh, Facebook or Instagram that you've come across recently or that you've heard that's just been stuck in your head. And it may actually go back to the the line from the Oprah book, but is there some advice out there that you've received that you want to share with others? Okay. So number one, when adding people to your team, consider character, competence. Oh, Hey, I like it. <laughs> character, competence, and chemistry. Mm. Okay. So there's that. Um, and then here's one that I just, I captured in the book, green lights. It's not about win or lose. It's do you accept the challenge? See, this is why I love hanging out with rule breakers. This is why I love you. You and I, uh, don't like to be tied down to, uh, specifics. A lot of times we want to be able to riff a little bit more, but also not have to follow the rules quite as much because I think it, uh, kind of back to that trust and inspire, it leads to, uh, really good thoughts. Ash, um, I would keep talking to you as you know, but I promise to make sure I'd get you out of here on time. Uh, I adore you and appreciate all the hard work you do for us, but also appreciate you as a friend. And thanks for making time for us. The feeling is mutual and I uh, would love to come back anytime you'd love to have me. Well, we will make that work. So uh, enjoy your afternoon and we'll talk soon. Okay. Thanks. See you later.